welcome to My Brain is a Wonderland, a podcast for neurodivergent women and the people who love them. You're here with your host, Emily, talking about everything to do with being late diagnosed as a woman with ADHD and autism. Welcome back, everybody. I am starting a two-part episode today. I was getting this whole episode prepared and realized it was going to be a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. So I've decided part one is today, next time's going to be part two, and the topic today is friendships, making friends, finding friends, the process, the difficulties, the joys. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, because I know that a lot of neurodivergent people, including myself, really struggle with a lot of aspects of friendship identifying friends, making friends, sustaining friendships, all that good stuff. This first episode, I'm going to be talking about my childhood all through my teens into maybe my early 20s, and the next episode is going to be about mostly adulthood, talking about female friendships and friendships in the workplace. So growing up, I had this really weird internalization of who I was as a friend. I knew I was shy. I definitely flaked on people constantly once I became a teenager. And I really internalized that as being part of me being an only child. Only children are, you know, don't have siblings, so they're seen to not have social skills. They are used to being around adults. I don't think that really explains being flaky, except if you say only children are shy. But that's how I kind of internalized it and blamed everything that I was doing with regards to friends on being an only child and being a little bit shy. And what I actually realized later is that almost all of it was based on being neurodivergent and the anxiety surrounding that. So let's start with preschool. What is funny about preschool, which my mom would talk about. She ran the preschool. If you don't know that, listen to my past episodes. She ran the preschool I was in, which was helpful in a lot of ways. And what I would do is I would go up to children, other children. I was two and a half, three years old. And instead of trying to communicate with them, I don't know what two and a half and three year olds do, but I would just go up to these children and hit them and take their toys. Just kind of say, you know, I want this toy, so I'm going to take it and not communicate that with them or try to even engage with them. And I've read online that this is actually a sign of autism, is this kind of seeming selfish, seeming unaware of other people's, other kids' emotions and needs. So I did that a bunch. People in my family used to laugh about it. That's another thing you internalize, right, is that your personality is funny, should be made fun of, is silly, is like, oh, you're such an idiot kind of thing. And I super internalized that. But actually, it's just something I didn't know how to mitigate. I didn't know at two and a half, three years old what I was supposed to do. And no one showed me. They just thought I was an ass face, apparently. Another thing, which is a sign of autism, is I had a very strong sense of justice. I still do. For me, if you tell me rules, I stick by the rules. I find it very difficult to deviate from what people say you should do, especially in the workplace. If there are rules, I follow the rules. Same thing in school. One time we were in a line to play on, you know, those pedal bikes. And in my preschool, I think it was once a week, we had pedal bike time. With all the pedal bikes, we would pull out of the closet, you know. And we're lining up for the coolest pedal bike. It's either a motorcycle or some cool silver plastic car or something. And me and my friend, or this kid I knew, is sitting in front of me in line. And a kid from behind me runs up and jumps on this pedal bike and tries to pedal away. To me, he skipped the line. That's not okay. So I grab the back of his shirt as he tries to pedal away. And essentially, you know, clothesline the kid. Just yank him off the bike, flat on his back. My face slams into the floor. We're both bleeding and crying. It's all kinds of terrible. 
So this is the stuff I was doing as a child that just doesn't vibe with other children. Taking their toys, I wouldn't like that. I would hate that and would probably hit you if you did that when I was two and a half or three. I wouldn't like to be pulled off the back of a bike because I didn't see a rule or even intentionally flouted a rule. That is not necessarily something we should be attacked for, but these are the things I felt so strongly about. And they got in the way of me making friends, obviously. That I seemed aggressive, I'm gonna say. And I definitely didn't make any long-lasting friends from that situation. Then I went through schooling, starting, you know, with reception in the UK, kindergarten in the US, and my relationships with girls were always weird. Always weird and complicated. There was always a vibe of like Mean Girls. It's the only way I can describe it. From the age of five or six onwards, it was this kind of, we are friends, but I don't actually like you. And I don't really know how else to describe it except that way. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit in the next episode, because I want to talk primarily about female relationships and work relationships in the next episode. But when I started school, I just tended to gravitate more towards boys for friendships. Not necessarily in elementary school. I don't know if it just wasn't encouraged or it didn't happen that way. And again, I'll talk about this tomorrow about how me and women kind of vibed or didn't vibe. But once I could choose my own friendships, it wasn't our moms or friends you're going to this person's place, we're going to school, or we're going to class outside of school with this friend. Once I could choose, and that would have been high school, starting around 12, 13, I started hanging out with mostly boys. And I spoke to my therapist about this because I do believe that gender is a construct, but that construct does have stereotypes. Just as you can say that genetically men and women might be different in certain ways, the constructs are different. And so I said to my therapist, you know, I'm mostly comfortable with men. It's just how I've always been, boys and men. And she said that stereotypically, it could be that men are usually bonding with each other over interests versus your actual emotions. So men aren't going to each other or their friends. Hey, how are you feeling today? Let's talk about that. Or let's talk about how that made you feel and your experience. It's more like, I love this movie. Do you love this movie? Let's talk about this movie. And that, I think, is from my neurodivergency. That's how I like to connect. I'm obsessed with my special interests. I'm obsessed with popular culture. And that's how I like to connect with others, is connecting over those interests which has mostly led me to boys and men in my friendships. At the beginning of high school, I had a couple of male friends that I cultivated in the first year or so. I think a lot of that was that the main guy in it, I was good friends with these two guys, but the main guy in it was very extroverted. And the other guy wasn't. So we were kind of the shy ones. And then our extroverted male friend was the top of the pyramid, right? Who helped to kind of bring us together, bring us out of our shell, and make us socialize. And that's actually been a commonality as well, is that the men that I hang out with and the boys tend to have been very extroverted, do a lot of the heavy lifting at the beginning in the relationship in terms of like showing up. Um, asserting themselves, saying, hello, how are you, blah, blah, blah. And so we would hang out all the time. And it was easy because I think a lot of it in school, like with work, if you spend five days a week with each other, all of the stuff is already done. So if you want to hang out on the weekend, that's easy. I can just talk to you at school. We don't need to make separate arrangements. And There isn't a weird vibe between us because we haven't seen each other because we see each other constantly. 
Well, what happened with that is, I want to say one to two years later, it was definitely no more than two years, maybe just the one, the main extroverted guy who I was really best friends with, he enrolled in a performing arts boarding school. So he moved away. We lived very close to each other within a 20 minute walk. And he moved away. He moved to a boarding school. So he didn't come home. He stayed there all the time. And the problem is with that is he wanted to talk on the phone a lot. This was before, this would have been 1998, 99, you know, instant chat, email, very much in its infancy. It was not used to communicate with your friends. It was used for official things or doing stuff online. It wasn't like you were chatting through email to people. An instant chat was to find like weirdos online. You weren't chatting to your friends. So we had to talk on the phone. And with my auditory processing issues, which if you listen to the episode prior, yesterday's episode, we'll tell you all about it. Talking on the phone is not my favorite thing. When it's super extended, it makes me anxious. I don't know. There's something about it I don't like. Not seeing body language. But that is how our relationship had to continue. Well, he told me that they had, it was either a Christmas or end of year performance at his boarding school, and he wanted me to go. And this was a long time ago, so a lot of it's fuzzy. But the idea was that another friend of his that I had never met, that I did not know, was going to pick me up at my house and drive us to the boarding school to see this performance. I don't remember if I was comfortable with this from the get-go. Sometimes I overcommit and say, yeah, sure, and then back out because I'm feeling all dopamine, serotonin up and feeling like, yes, I can do this. And then two weeks later, by the time the event comes around, I'm like, no, I I just want to go to bed and snuggle. Please stop telling me I have to go to this thing. So I'm not sure exactly where I was at the time when I agreed to do it. But I do remember that I completely ghosted him and his friend. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think the guy might have, his friend might have pulled up outside my house. I didn't live in a house. I lived in a masonette in a block, which is good for these situations because they can't find your house, right? They can't get into your block. They can't knock on your door. I've done that before. This isn't the first time I've done that. But the person showed up, I believe, and was trying to pick me up. And I just ghosted them. Just pretended I wasn't there. Pretended it wasn't happening. I don't remember the full extent of the text messages after. There were probably voicemails, I don't know, that I kind of didn't listen to and just ignored. But he basically, my friend from the boarding school, just completely dropped me you know just said like are you kidding why are you doing this this is not okay this is not what I expect you agreed to do this and I totally accept that that was not the right thing to do it's not something I would do now but I didn't realize why I was doing it back then and it seems so trivial right like someone says you're my best friend come see me perform in a show. And I love arts. I love theater. Totally my vibe. That's why we were together and hung out as friends. That's why we loved each other, because of all the artistic crap that we loved. And I couldn't do it. And I think it was when he said I had to go with the person I didn't know. It was bad enough that I had to go there and didn't know anyone there. None of his friends had never been to the school, but I think I could do that. Like I said, socially prescribed. I could show up to something, expect, what do you do with a performance? Here's my ticket. Here's your chair. Sit down. Enjoy. I knew his family. So if his mom, dad, sister had been there, it would have been super easy. That was not an issue. I think it really was that he threw into the mix that this friend was going to pick me up that I'd never met and I was done. Don't like cars. Don't like new people. Done. And this has happened to me more than once, or I don't want to say it that way, happened to me more than once. I have done this more than once. I'm going to take responsibility right there. I have done this more than once. I have 
one of two things, either completely forgotten about a, an appointment with somebody and then ghosted them because I'm embarrassed, or ghosted them immediately before setting up an appointment because the idea of an appointment is just too horrific. I actually remember now a time in my early 20s where I'd left a job, but I had super connected with my manager at that job. I think she was neurodivergent. She had irritable bowel syndrome like I did. We just connected. I'm pretty sure she was neurodivergent. It's almost only the only women I connect with are neurodivergent. And I left this job and we texted between each other and said, okay, let's hang out at this time at this place. And I remember that day I got off the train. This was in California. Got off the train and she texts me, well, are you coming? You know, it's been, I've already let, had her waiting for 20 or 30 minutes and she didn't say it like that she said something like hey are you on your way or something like that and I ghosted her just absolute shame and embarrassment came over me I was horrified I would have had to have taken I think five or six train stops from where I'd just gotten off to get to her and then walked 15 or 20 minutes to get to the restaurant where she was and it just seemed insurmountable and the panic set in, and I just completely ghosted her. And she recognized it too. She could tell, and I don't know if it's because she'd done it before or it happened to her before, but she texted me and said something to the effect of, let's work on this. You know, I really want to see you. It's okay if you forgot about this or whatever, but let's work on our friendship. I want to hang out with you, ghosted her. Just couldn't deal. Couldn't deal with the shame looking at me. I couldn't deal with looking at her face while she looked at me disappointed. I just couldn't deal with it, even through text message. And I just ignored her. And we never spoke again, ever. We're friends on Instagram, we're friends on Facebook, all that stuff. We have never spoken since that moment, ever. And it makes me sad because. I lose all these connections because of that. I leave jobs and then I'm not able to sustain this friendship. And again, I probably wouldn't do that now. These are more things I would apologize for. I'd set a schedule. I'd have it in there. And then even if I forgot, I would just say, I'm sorry I messed up. I didn't do that back then because I didn't know why. I didn't know why I was doing this and I felt like such an ass. So I just didn't say anything. And that's just what I did for the majority of my teen years through early 20s, honestly. But to circle back to high school and talk about another friendship that I had, it was another guy. We met when I was around 14, and he was very extroverted. That's, like I said, if you're extroverted and approach me, I can deal with that. And what happened is one lunch break, one of my classmates, who was friends with him, we were all in the same room hanging out in homeroom or whatever, and said, oh, you like Buffy? Buffy the Vampire Slayer? You should talk to Emily. And this guy literally just sidled up to me and was like, you like Buffy? Let's chat. And that was the beginning. We bonded over shared interests, not over emotions or feelings, it was shared interests. And what we did is every Saturday, we did the same thing at the same time. For at least a year, every Saturday, I would meet him at the Harrow bus station, that's my bus station in London, like a bus depot, he'd be in the same spot in the station every Saturday, at noon, we confirm it by text on a Thursday or Friday. It's going to be 12, right? He'd wear the same thing. We were both obsessed with Buffy. He had blonde hair, so he'd wear a black shirt, black pants, black shoes, and a long leather coat to look like Spike. And we'd go to the movies every Saturday without fail. We'd just go and see the latest movie, whatever we wanted to see, because we still are now obsessed with popular culture sci-fi, fantasy, all that stuff. So we would go to the movies together. And I really think that 
That familiarity and doing the same thing every week made it easy for me to be friends with him. It wasn't, let's do something new and crazy every week. Let's do something that it, it was just the same and enjoyable and what I love. And that's actually something I continued into when I was 17 and 18. I had another male friend and we would do the same thing whenever we would hang out. We'd go to London Zoo together. We'd go to the IMAX theater together in London. It was this kind of doing the same thing every time. And I don't know why they were okay with that. Were they neurodivergent? Or is that a guy thing? I don't know. But I've just generally been able to connect with the male gender, constructed or not, in general, as a friendship. And for me, I'm not trying to discuss dating, friendships, the relationship with my mother. And I just feel like every time I'm talking with a woman, that's what they want to talk about. And I just don't want to talk about that. So my most successful relationships and the ones that I love and have endured and make me feel good have been with boys and men. Again, I don't really know what that means, but that's what it is. And I don't shy away from that. I am trying to make more friends with women, but I really just connect with men easily. And I want things to be easy. I don't want to have to stretch every part of myself to create a friendship. I don't think that's what you should do in life. Go towards what you're good at, what you love, not what, you know, is difficult. What's difficult can be a side hobby. You don't want that to be the focus of your entire life. So that's my experience with being a child, a woman, growing up, a girl with ADHD and autism. Friendships have been difficult, mostly gravitated towards boys and men, shared my interests. And what I'm going to do on next time's episode, part two of this friendship episode, is I'm going to talk about, really dig into my relationships with women and talk about how those were in my childhood, how they weren't successful, and what really made me feel that way. With that, I want to say thank you for tuning in today. I'm so glad you're here. If you have been listening and enjoying this, please leave a positive review wherever you're listening. On Spotify, it's super easy. Five stars, boom, you're done. Not sure about Apple, but I know you can review on there, maybe on Google Podcasts as well. But please do that. It helps me to reach more people and really gets us going as a community. I want to reach more people, more women, and help other women get through these issues. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time on My Brain is a Wonderland. Bye-bye.